Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Welcome back. As always, I'm Dan alongside Matt. And this week we're joined by a friend of the podcast. We're here with Kevin Olenek, the host of the Shifts and Pucks podcast. How are you doing, Kevin? I, I'm good. I'm good. How, how are it's It's good to be talking about... I, I, I'm glad to be joining you. I don't know if it's good to be talking about Flames hockey right now, but we are talking about Flames hockey. And- Somebody's got to do the dirty job, yeah, right? Exactly. Exactly. So just off the top of the show here, just so everyone knows, we're going to be doing a two-week crossover episode. We'll call it that. Kevin's joining Matt and I this week. Next week, I'm not going to be able to do the podcast. Um, I'm going to be in the U.S. and not able to watch Flames games. I think that's the first time uh, in 12 yeah, years, right? Matt? I've missed a couple, but you've been here um, all the time. There you go. So I get a break once in a while. So I'm uh, I'm using my banked vacation time and going away for a week. So Matt will be joining the guys on Shifts and Pucks this week. If you listen to their Flames episode, which we'll let Kev promote at the end. And we will put that discussion on our feed. So for our listeners, you will you will get a show at the regular time next week, but it'll sound a little bit different. My question for you, Dan, is this. Um, if New Orleans is sinking, do you want to swim? Um, I'm able to swim. Do I want to swim? It depends where I'm going to. That's entirely fair. I don't know if Gordon, the, the hip, ever really thought that through. I don't think so, but maybe Matt will send the corporate yep. jet to pick me up. Fair. Fireside chat one. It's yeah, like Air it's Force One. It's actually just a remote control, uh, you know, paper mache plane. <laughs> Matt's <laughs> going to send the drone and say, Dan, yep. <laughs> jump on. So as Kev said, I'm going to New Orleans, and uh, obviously there's no NHL there. So, um, Let's let's jump into this. First game this week was Calgary versus Dallas on November 1st. I'll give some of my thoughts on this, and I'll let you guys jump in. Obviously, a big game, the uh, NHL debut of Connor Zari. I thought that the Flames looked really good in the first. They looked good to start the second, and then they started to fall apart as the second went on. They finally made their comeback, but it wasn't enough, and... The way I'm summing this game up is they seem to finally understand their system. They seem to understand what's expected of them by the coach, but they need to better manage those momentum swings in a game. Matt, do you think that's fair? Yeah, and like when they started running around in their own zone and Dallas started turning up the pressure, like the Flames really didn't have an answer until they got reset and started reestablishing their game, and then they took it to the Stars for the rest of the contest. Kevin, what were your thoughts? Um, I felt like this was a team between. This was a game between a team that is really confident and a team that was really not confident. And you're right; the Flames got off to a great start, and they got uh, and they had a great end of the game. And I do agree with you that they started to figure out their system. They were able to create some chaos. I thought that was Mackenzie Weaker's best game of the year, um, and so. But they had that lull in the in the middle of the second period, and they were chasing the game again. And <clears throat> this team isn't confident enough to come back to chase a game. And you're facing what, who, what I believe um, is the will be the representative of the Western Conference in the Stanley Cup Final. But I still think that this is probably the best team in the Western Conference, the most complete team. And you know, but give the Flames credit; they you're right. They, they did all of the things that they needed to do for the most part. But Jake Ottinger put on his 2021, uh, was it 2021, 2021 or 2022 uh, Dallas Star playoff uh, uniform and stole the game again. That's what it felt like all over again, guys, didn't it? Like, it just felt like we we're in that, that playoff series all over again. It's like, oh, not you again. PTSD. Yeah. <laughs> and the Flames have had a lot um, of PTSD. The Flames fans have had a lot of PTSD. What? Connor Zari's debut. Anybody have anything but nice things to say about the kid? Well, he didn't score a hat trick, so, geez, you know, that's pathetic. <laughs> Matt, he was in the American League for a reason, my friend. Yeah. Only one goal. Come on. <laughs> it's a long season. You got to pace yourself. Yeah. I mean, there's a guard that's doing better. Like, come on, Connor. Represent your name. And then uh, the second game this week, the Flames were in Seattle to take on the Kraken. So a short 
uh, road trip there. We saw another Flame debut in this one. Marty Pospisil debuted um, for the Flames. Not a name I expected to be talking about debuting this year, but good to see him. And I guess maybe the thing we need to talk about as well is the Manjapani cross-check and the subsequent one-game suspension. Let's start with Kevin this time. Kevin, what were your thoughts on this one? Well, I can I, I'm going to start with the Manjapani sure. play in and of itself before we get into the suspension. It was... It was the epit when I watched that, I was like, this is the epitome of what the Calgary Flames have been all year. Is they were going in to get the goal, they were starting to get the open the score, and I think they they would have scored. Uh Grubauer makes a big save, McCann jumps on it. And I think just think this was an incredibly selfish play that quite frankly, if Ryan Husk had decided to bench him for the rest of the game, uh, if it was not a match penalty, I would have been okay with it. Um I, I, I just, that play really frustrated me from just a play point of view. There was no need for that to happen. Um, and he put, he put the Flames in an awkward position. Um, could have Vladar have made that save? Sure. But again, it's down to Manjapani who's making, who made a poor play on the power play. But ultimately, this this Flames team, you're right with the system. They figured, they started to kind of figure it out. They killed the rest of that, that, that power play, the three and a half minutes. Um they almost blow in on that two man advantage. Yeah, it was um, at the was tail Hamilton's end. Goal a power play goal. Yeah, there was only like five was. or six seconds left, but yeah, it, it was a power play goal. And then the Flames and to just smell blood in the third period, and um, they play. That was their, I think, one of their better team efforts in the second half of the year uh, of the second half of the game. And for all of the Vladar naysayers, this was, I thought Vladar was great. I, I, he made a couple of huge saves. He kept them in the game, he kept them win. And, you know, that meme at the end of the, uh, at the end there with the flames kind of raising the hallelujah, I thought it's, that will live forever. But it was a good win for the flames, finally. Yeah, and frankly, with the Manjapani hit, like I, I'm actually surprised that it was only a one-game suspension because, frankly, I thought that was a more dangerous hit than uh, the Anderson hit because, um, like, he could have really done some damage to McCann. They showed a similar hit on Sportsnet from the playoffs. There was a two-game suspension. I'm thinking if a playoff game's two, you can't give any more than that for, what, game 10 of the regular we, season? But. But I always go to what Brian Burke has always said, Dan, about two two playoff games equal four regular season games. It's a double or yeah, and that that's literally what I was expecting was a four minimum game suspension. So the fact that it's only one is beneficial for him, but uh, you know, just a completely reckless and dangerous play by Manjapane that was not warranted or needed. And, like, not in his character either. I could see that no. if that was, you know, Lucic last year, somebody who that's kind of their job. But when I saw his Manjapani, when I was watching it, going, who was that? Like, that's the last guy I would have expected to be doing that. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, credit to uh, Martin Pospisil for scoring in his NHL debut. I like the stat that you have to go all the way back to Patrick Sealoff uh, for the last Flame to score in their debut in 2016. And then Connor Zari got the title for three days. <laughs> well, 2001 was the last time two rookies scored consecutively back to back in their first games, and that was for New Jersey. So long time. Yeah, yeah. So, so we guys, gotta recall if, somebody for the next one. If I'm and, the GM, I was just gonna say that. Who's the next guy up from Stockton? Like, let's just roll these guys and, and keep getting yeah. some goals. Well, hey, Pat Patterson, get your butt up here. Yeah. <laughs> Klapka, you're next. <laughs> Sign that Sutter kid. Um. Can we also, I, just to talk about Prospisola a little bit, I think this is a great story. This is a guy sure. who's been through so many injuries. Um, and and he's, I know it was a surprise, but this is a fourth round pick. He found his way through the injuries to get himself up there. And then former GM, Flame GM, I love this quote, but Brad Trillman has, this is a guy that can find trouble in church. Um, and I think <laughs> that we, the Flames need that edge um, and it was it was a greasy goal he got, so it was, sounds like a very possible goal. Um, I was really happy with him, but let's not forget it was Nick De Simone also made his Flames his uh, 2020 his regular season debut this year with the Flames as well, uh, and he got his first NHL point as well in that game. And I believe it was the assist on the third goal, the Sharagovich goal. I believe it was that was it. Yeah. 
Yeah, Sharon oh. Govich from Zadorov and DeSimone. Yeah. So um, we can get it. We'll get into him a little bit more, but he should be congratulated as well. Yeah, and I'm liking the fact that the Flames are bringing up the kids to give them an actual shot because, it, you know, frankly, like a guy like Pospisil, he doesn't really have anything left to prove at the AHL, and he's played well enough where he deserves a call-up to see if he can land the fourth-line winger role and play that physical, edgy game that he brings. Before we get away from this game, I also just want to mention that Dan Vladar was in net against Seattle. I thought that as the game went on, his game really straightened out, too. He looked kind of shaky a little bit in the first. He was not tracking the puck well, but I think Vladar was... I mean, he obviously didn't steal the game for the Flames, but I think he had the game the Flames needed him to have in that one. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I thought... I would argue he kind of did in a little bit. Um, I think one of the things that I was struggling... Um, there were some really poor pa- continues, maybe, to be some poor passing from the Flames' defense to the forward. There were a couple of pizzas delivered in Seattle. Uh, one from Uyghur that was on a Borgstrand's stick, I, I remember, and another one from Tanev as well. I, there's, there's still a disconnect from that defensive forward in terms of passing. There's some issues there, but, I mean, you know, none of those were Vladar's issues. No, 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 but I think Vladar stood up really well at the end there too so i think it a little he did i think it helped he I, he certainly helped there so with those games in the books now the flames have played 11 games they're three wins seven losses one overtime loss for a total of seven points gentlemen they're finally above edmonton edmonton is two seven and one for five points and of course we're above san jose who has one point well i heard uh one person complaining uh that was an oilers fan that, you know, like, we all make fun of San Jose, but their goaltending save percentage is 869, and the Oilers' save percentage is 864. <laughs> you know what? I have uh, I have San Jose's goaltender in my hockey pool. I have no idea how I keep getting points for the guy. Which one? Blackwood? Yep. Oh, that's hilarious. So let's let's talk. We talked a little bit about Pospisil. I'll give my thoughts there, and then we'll talk about the guys that got sent down. I think Marty Pospisil could be, from what I've seen of him at the HL level, a fourth-line winger. I don't see much more projection on this kid. I mean, he's 23. He can play wing. He can play a bit of center. He's 6'2", 172 pounds. I think if the Flames can use him like a Walker Dewar, a cheap fourth-line option, I think that's great. But I don't project him to be much higher than that. How about you guys? Yeah, same here. And it's one of those things that it's better to have good young guys that can play with pace and like like you saw on his goal driving the net where some of the veteran guys don't necessarily do those kind of things hearkening back to last year yeah he's a fourth third fourth line guy um i liked that he was with backland but he showed yeah i'm i'm just i want to see a little bit more from him i think that he brings a little bit of a work ethic and an edge that i think will help this organize the, this team right now um and he doesn't need to be more than a fourth liner though dad we don't need martin pros pros no we don't to be in the top set but i think there's a lot of I think there's a lot of fans that expect every young player to be the next top guy, and we need guys all up and down the lineup. And, and I agree with you, Kev. He doesn't need to be much more than that, but if he can even do that well, I think he's, you know, hitting his, his ceiling, which is exactly where we need him to be. Yeah. 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 And we need serviceable depth players, too. Like, you can't have everybody being a top six forward. Like, well, you need it. need guys that can actually fill out your lineup and be effective in their roles. And all the things that he's been bringing in the AHL and in his first game, it's exactly what you're looking for from a fourth line player. Matt, not everybody can be top six forwards, but right now we just need six guys to be top six forwards. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> That's our challenge. <laughs> um, True. So, so to go along with these, we did have some, uh, some things happen with uh, players being sent down or I guess sent down the hall, as we should say. Um, Jordan Osterley placed on waivers, cleared waivers, sent to the Wranglers. Matt Coronado sent to the Wranglers. Um, and then Matt Coronado scores the first and only goal in his first game with the Wranglers five minutes in to get the team the win. I've been saying since the beginning of the season that Coronado should be spending some time in the American League. I'm glad to see it's happening. I'm glad to see that he's 
looking good down there. Let's start with Kevin. Kevin, any surprises here? Any thoughts on these uh, on these reassignments? With Coronado, I'm with you, Dan. I, I, the, it was very clear, um, even in the Dallas game, um, when you put him at center. And I think Ryan Husko was trying not to say anything, but it, it got to the point where he had to uh, say that Coronado was right. Like, and I'm with you, Dan. He should have been down. I, I from the moment. I watched him in that first game against the Canucks at the Young Stars Classic. I'm like, this guy should be in the AHL. And the expectation on him right now to be an NHL player, I just, I think that he's got a great shot. I think he's got great offensive instincts, but um, I think he needs, there's other things in terms of decisions that he's made. He needs to work on it. It's not a bad thing. And let him dominate the AHL. I just let him. Uh, I don't think I do. I, I'll, I don't think I'm getting ahead of myself. But this is a guy that I would not bring up, and I know that 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 he's going to be. And I disagree with the Flames on this one. I think this is a guy that you got to keep down in in the minors at this particular point and let him dominate. Let him get that confidence, um, and let him get ready for you know the AHL is a growing is is a development place for the NHL and what Daryl Sutter, you know, I mean, all the th- the one thing that he said about the that whole Jacob Pelche comment that was right is the AHL is not the NHL. Run. These players to come in from call like there's some that can, but sometimes it doesn't always happen. And Matt Coronado needs the work. And you know, if the AHL is not the NHL, there's no way the NCAA is. And that's no. where he's coming from. Like this guy needs some pro seasoning. Matt, what do you think? I agree. And it, it's one of those where it his game he looked like a rookie and that's fine and it's necessary for him to get the experience in the nhl level um so that way he can see exactly this is what it's going to take to be up here now go back to the farm go kick some butt learn 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 some more and then maybe later in the season february on you bring him back, I would not want him back anytime soon just to give him plenty of time on the first line. Yeah, and, you know, I think at least the Flames can say to themselves, to the player and to the fans, we tried it, right? We didn't just assign him to the HL. We tried it. It didn't work. So let's send him down. Not saying it will never work, but, I mean, you guys have both heard me rant about Sam Bennett, and I still think Sam Bennett would have been better served with American Hockey League time. And I think, especially with where the Flames are right now with the season and where we might see their team going, I think that you're doing nothing but a favor for this kid to send him to the American League and let him develop. No, and we we saw in the past with guys like Sam Bennett where they were just stuck in the NHL and remained there, and like his offensive game kind of plateaued because he wasn't given the time to develop that higher level offensive game, and he was a player that could have used a lot of time down in the A to be a more well-rounded player, and you know it's nice to see the Flames changing their way of doing things to accommodate the players properly well there even dylan dubay said he wished he had more ahl time as you know that he had right so um yeah i uh, i'm with you guys it's just i i i would let the even let matt coronado run through a wrangler playoff run let's let's see what he's what where he's at i totally yeah. agree and, and i think with you know with where the play the flames are at i think that you know there's no reason to bring him up even for a playoff run. I don't think he's going to be a top six guy this year. Let him stay down there till whatever the end is for the Wranglers and then, you know, try it again next year. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't mind if after the trade deadline, he was recalled just to get some experience through the end of the regular season. I'm assuming that the flames are going to be not a playoff team this season. So, you know, get him some time in the NHL for like the last like 15 games or so. And then go on the playoff run with Stockton or the the Wranglers. The Stockton Calgary Wranglers. Yes, it's the and first you know time what? in almost a year that I've screwed that you, up. We've both been doing good, Matt. Um, yep. You know, and while I don't disagree with you, Matt, if I'm the Flames and if I don't make the playoffs and I decide to use whatever R word you want, rebuild, retool, rejig, recycle, whatever you want to use. I think you've got to look at some of your older guys like Pospisil, like uh, Nikolaev, like Klapka, like. Uh, Emilio Pedersen before you take another look at 
uh, Coronado. So, I mean, yeah, they might bring him up even after the deadline, but I think, you know, even Ben Jones, some of those older guys, you've got to kind of know what you've got before you start looking at it again, I think. Yep. That's fair. Um, what do you guys think about Osterley sent down? I mean, what, when this season started, I expected Jordan Osterley to have either been the number seven a, a, or sort of the top guy in the American League. And with Shillington not here, and as far as we know now, Shillington probably not coming back this year at this point, um, I, I think that we're so used to all having Michael Stone as our um, as our number seven, right? The guy who's always ready to go. The guy who can play at a moment's notice. The guy who, you know, was always rock solid. And Osterley wasn't proving to be that. I don't think he'll be down all year. I think you'll see him and D. Simone and Gilbert kind of rotate in and out. But, you know, I think the AHL right now, especially with how depleted the Wranglers blue line is, that's probably the best place for him to, like Coronado, just get some play time. Yeah, with what you- Poirier's injury, I think that became more necessary for Osterley to go down. Yeah. What do you think, Kevin? Yeah, I think um, I think you're right that there's a three-way rotation there. Um, but I also think the Flames are going to have to upgrade that that position as well. Um, even going f- like if you if the Flames are not making the plays or not, I, I just I don't know if I was completely impressed with Nick DeSimone last night. I think he had some moments, but I'm, I wasn't overly enamored. Um, and I, but he's I, a number six. I mean, how many number sixes are you enamored with? Yeah, I, I you know what you, you need to you need to have a guy. I just I I think you need to have your number six to feel like like you're confident. I, I want my number six to be somewhat what you would get from an Eric Gabranza, which was just a solid guy that he, he knows his role. I feel like Nick D. Simone was a little bit lost at times, so. I think that Gilbert is the better number six over D. Simone at this point. I agree. I totally yeah, agree. and it's one of those where, you know, the Flames may end up hitting the waiver wire at some point to, you know, get up a number six if there's somebody that's put on over the next few weeks. But Yeah, I don't think at this point urgent. with where the Flames are, you'll see them give up an asset for a, a number six body. Yeah, um, no, I was, I was uh, saying from the waiver wire for sure. But. Yeah. Yeah, or, you know, I mean, our previous GM was fascinated with bringing in defensemen at the trade deadline. Like, if they wait that long, they can. But I think at this point, this organization has to say we're moving on from Shillington. It kind of feels like for two years now, we've had a number six that we didn't expect to be a number six because we're waiting for Shillington. I don't know about you guys. I don't think you can bring Shillington back at this point and expect him to be NHL ready. And after two years out of the league, his contract expires at the end of the year. I don't think he comes back to the National Hockey League. I, I don't want to make any speculations about the future for Oliver Shillington, but I'm not expecting him to be back this year. I think no. if he is, he would have to, you know, find some way to put him on an HL assignment for a bit to work up that rust. Yeah. Matt, anything? Yeah, you- I, d- I don't see Shillington back at all. No. So if they can get a guy off waivers, great. But otherwise, I think, you know what, there's going to have to muddle through with the uh, three-headed monster at number six there. So with all that said, I'll ask each of you individually, um, knowing knowing what we've seen this week, knowing where the team's at, would you keep Pospisil and or Zari up and Coronado down, or would you uh, change that configuration? Let's start with Kevin. Kevin, would you keep Pospisil, Zari up, and Coronado down? As long as Pospisil and Zari are producing, yeah. I I mean, I think certainly it, it certainly feels like Connor Zeri has brought something to Nazem Kadri's game. I thought this, he looked really good. And I, you know, I thought he looked, I, I thought he looked a lot better than a lot of other people thought did in the, in the, uh, at the heritage classic. But um, I think it, you know, um, he certainly looked a lot more rejuvenated. That line seemed to have something that the, this team has lacked for the last couple of years. And that's called chemistry. So, yeah, I would definitely, as long as Zuri is being productive, yeah. And I, um, you call it chemistry. Potato. I call it desire to win, potato, potato. Yeah. Um, but with P- Pospisil, too, um, I think, you know, again, we don't, it, it, you don't need him to be more than a third or fourth liner. I think he would work great with Michael Backlund and Blake Coleman. Um, you're not asking him to be, to score a lot of goals. 
Um, and we'll get into this a little bit later. I think they don't have a, a possible guy, and I wouldn't mind him facing, going face to face, and seeing, kind of giving that flames the flames a little bit of that edge back that I think that they have lost. I agree, Matt. That's something I know yeah. you really like. Yeah. Well, this team for the longest time has been too easy to play against, and usually when you see like the elite playoff teams like they have a couple of really nasty SOBs in their lineup and uh, Zadorov has been a revelation on the blue line for that and if the Flames can incorporate more of that type of guy over the next handful of seasons like that would be exactly what this team needs to take that next step because frankly with not having that kind of guy on the team when you need a boot in the butt to get going, like there's nobody there to actually give it. So having that type of guy in there to throw the big hit or do something interesting uh, helps everybody else as well. I think possible almost needs to be a better AJ Greer than AJ Greer. Yeah. And I don't think um, AJ you know, Greer and, and, has the experience with this team yet to be what they want him to be. I think he's got the potential to be, but I think he needs he still needs time. I agree. And you mentioned Pospisil with Backlund and Coleman, and I can totally see that for the next game it, with uh, with Manjapani out. But I think also having Pospisil, Greer, Dewar working together, I think that's gonna that could be a really interesting kind of fourth line. It's not your big lumbering, you know, hitter fourth line, but I think it's a fourth line that can both be physical and you know have a little bit of speed and and uh, drive to them as well. Yeah. Yep. But then if you're putting um, Pospis on with Dube, Dube or Dewar and Greer, who are you putting back on Coleman with? I think you probably put Dubé there. And then who's with Lindholm and Hamburg H- H- Uh I would probably go uh, – well, that's a good question, yeah. And, and you know, it dep- I think it, there, it depends a lot. I could see them try and share and Govich up there after last game. Uh, I don't know if you want to touch that line, but, yeah, it's a good question. <sighs> Well, let's talk about actually that. So one of our fans wrote in, uh, Fear the Flaming Sea on Twitter is his name. He goes by Dime. And listener question, the Zari, Kadri, Sharon, Govich line would be an interesting discussion because they're gelling pretty well. We've all had our, I guess, issues with Kadri this year. Sharon Govich has played up and down the lineup all the way from one to four. It does look like we've kind of got something there. And even if, you know, Zari cools off a little bit, I think if he can show that he's, Making those other two guys better, he could easily stay on this team. Matt, what do you think of that line? I agree. It, it's been ever since the beginning of the week, he, that line's been good. And they seem to have found a natural fit, which perfect. And frankly, like it, hearkening back to when Kadri was with the Avalanche, um, Zari and Sharon Govich have a lot of the similar attributes to guys like Burakovsky that that he had on his line. What about you, Kevin? Yeah, I would, I mean, that line seems to be, the Flames have to find the flickers of things that are working well, and that line is working well. Like, like Kadri, let's, I mean, it has he been good? No, not necessarily, but he hasn't had a good time here either, and it seems like he's got some energy with these guys. I would keep them together. And, you know, I, I, I feel like Sharon Govich got a little bit like, no, I mean, earlier this week, there were some flame fans that were um, ranting and raving about the Tyler Toffoli trade. And, you know, they didn't get enough. I, I, he's got two, th- Igor has got two, three goals. He's on pace for 15 to 20 goals, which was his peak him. Like let this guy play. And yeah, like, I, I don't know. He, I think this line, this line works overall. And I think Igor has been, overall pretty good for the flames for the most part i mean he's had his moments he's not he's not the toughest guy for sure he's not the most assertive guy but you you put him in situations where he feels comfortable he's going to be okay and i think he feels comfortable with kadri and zari and let it let it roll we won't rehash it but if anyone's interested you can go back to last week's episode or Watch some of our shorts on Instagram, TikTok uh, this week. And Matt actually detailed why he thought that this was the perfect kind of trade for Tyler Toffoli. So we won't get back into that, but go back and listen to that from last week if you're interested. 
I agree with what both you guys are saying. I think that, you know, we could put Kadri and Sharon Govich together. It's not going to work. I think it's Zari that gives them the zip. And you guys remember the 3M line years ago? Um, like, you know, that was more than some of its parts. Remember when Froleek was on a line with Backland and I forgot who was on there and that was better than some of its parts? Yeah, like, sometimes we just get these. That's right. Yeah. So, you know, it was like, you know, sometimes we get a line that just works and I don't know what it is, but for some reason, this line just works. And I think, you know, with Kadri underperforming for the start of the year, I think you've just got to run this line until it stops working. And the, you know, yeah. And, and yeah. frankly, the backland line, like it, with the Kadri line and now the backland line being good and the fourth line arguably being the most consistently good for what they do throughout the season like now all of a sudden you've got three lines that are actually working well so you know that will help the team moving forward and if just feel that huberto and Mangiapani do have some chemistry together um they seem to work well they feed off each other pretty well so that kind of works i mean i know that I know I'm, I'm, I'm trying to figure out why Lindholm and Huber. I think I'm kind of starting to figure out why Lindholm and Huber aren't working together, but it's still a bit of a... What's the secret, Kevin? Uh, he doesn't skate as well as Goudreau, Huber, though. I think that that's the biggest difference. Um, Goudreau it was a really quick skater and can get into those... Uh, uh, get into any area of the ice with, with precision and speed that allowed Lindholm to get himself into a quiet area. Huberto doesn't skate the way that Goodrow does, and he doesn't carry the puck the way with that same sort of zip that Goodrow has. And I think that that's where the problem is. It's Lindholm trying to set up Huberto where Goodrow was trying to set up Lindholm. Um, and I think that that's part of the problem here. That could definitely be, yep. You know, and, and I think that, you know, is Connor Zari a second line left winger in the NHL? I don't think he is yet. But, you know, obviously the Flames are having some issues. They have some challenges here. I mean, really, the only new forward outside of Zari and Postulus here is Sharon Govich. Otherwise, the same guys they've had for Andrew. years. The same. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, you know, Sharon Govich is really the only new guy outside the organization with Greer because the other two were inside. But, like, you know, they've had issues on the wing for a while. And to me, if Zari can do it, make a, you know, run it there. And it doesn't always have to be your second line in terms of ice time. I mean, you know, if that line's working, just keep it going. The other thing I think that's great about Zari right now, he doesn't have to be kind of the, the, the trigger man that he was in the AHL. He's got good passing. He can play, I think, an all-around forward game. I think that Zari's working well there because he can be whatever Kadri needs him to be. Yeah, he reminds me a bit of Kadri. He reminds me a little bit of Bohor, Bohorovat too. Um, sort of has some very similar styles, right? So, I I think Connor Zeri is an NHLer. I do think that where he will land, I'm not I'm not entirely sure, but I do think that we'll see a regular career out of Connor Zeri in the NHL. Yeah, and I think he's just delayed because of his injury. I mean, he lost a year of development to injury, so I think, you know, he's one of these, you know, later guys. But, yeah, I think I think he's ready. I just don't know where he fits in the lineup. Yeah. Well, I think this is... And I think his play will determine that over time. For sure. Um, and then another listener question we had, and I'll throw to Matt on this one first. Which Wrangler is going to score next on their debut in the NHL from Ryan Alim on Facebook? So I'm thinking maybe what Ryan's saying is which... Guy gets called up from the Wranglers next, who's also going to score in his debut game. Who do you think the next uh, call-up is? Well, I would have to go with Big Adam Klapka on that one. Yeah, I think especially with Ruzhishka out, I can see that being a good call-up. Kevin, what do you think? Yeah, I was going to go with Klapka, but I wouldn't be surprised if we see Matt Coronado get called up for the Nashville game, um, even though we, we, as mentioned, disagree with it. And lo and behold, he scores a goal. Has he scored yet? He did score, right? He has one goal. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I would. I if it was me, I would probably go with Adam Klapka on that. Um, or what? just kind of just kind of on a side note there, I'll ask you both. We're seeing rookies, you know, as we always have, come out and do their lap. I know the NHL is a new rule that you got to wear your bucket during warm up. Do you think that they need to look at an exception for the guy playing his first game to take one lap without the bucket and then put it on? Quite frankly, I don't know what the NHL's rules on anything are anymore. Like I'm. I'm beyond confused with how the NHL reasons any of their rules. Um, like, you know, uh, you know, from suspensions to pride tape to 
anything else. I have no I no idea. Like, what do you think, man? Yeah. Well, we've seen with the Wheel of Justice randomly dishing out various things that you know it makes sense that the rest of their decision making is going to be whatever pops up on the fun wheel. Yeah, they. I think they spin the wheel for their for their justice. So. Kevin, you were mentioning pride tape. I had a weird idea this year. P- pride jerseys are not allowed, but pride tape is. What if they just totally tape their jersey in pride tape? That's then they have idea. a pride jersey, and pride tape's allowed. Yeah. I'd hate to be that equipment manager. <laughs> 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 but, you know, apparently it's okay. Um, so let, let me throw this question to each of you, and then uh, actually I'll give you my thoughts on the last one too. Who do I think will be next up? I agree with Cla- uh, with Klapka. I think, yes, we might see Coronado come up again. Um, I think Adam Klapka would be the guy, and again, I think the Flames are looking to fill sort of a bottom you know, six role. I think Klapka deserves a shot there. I think outside of Klapka, if you're going to bring up a, a forward, which I think is you know kind of who we're thinking of, they're going to score. The only other guy I could possibly see them trying out um, maybe Rory Kearns for a game, just because I, I think they might want to know what they have there, or Ben Jones. Those would be kind of the next two guys I think that might be up based on HL performance, age, that sort of thing. I would say Jones over Kearns. Um, but yeah, I think Klapka's, Klapka's a reasonable guess there. I'll throw one just for the hilarity of it. Sure. Uh, Dustin Wolf. <laughs> and then he scores a goal in his first game? Sure, why not? There you go. That That's the reason to keep the kid, right? Yeah. Now imagine if he gets more than one goal in the season. I mean, Zari's already got two points. Yeah. Then you got to keep the kid. Right? Um, let me ask. I'll, I'll ask Kevin this first and then Matt. I know, Kevin, you weren't on our show last week, but last week re- we really dived into the idea of is it time to rebuild this team? And Matt and I had a deep discussion of what that would look like. I know I've done some of the shifts and puck shows with you guys, and I think we're all a little bit down on this team now. After that Seattle game and that Dallas game, has your opinion on this team changed? Are you thinking or projecting there to be anything different than you did this time last week? The thing that is interesting to me is the fact that they stopped all contract discussions. And I I know that that was because and I, I know what the reports are saying out there and I it's true. It's probably because there's going to be some sort of it. At the very least, we'll use the word pivot because that's been the common word. But I also wonder- if, And it's not our word. No, but it's probably what Murray Edwards' word is. Um, I wonder if- it just kind of calmed the stress down on the team. I like, I thought like Noah Hannafin had a really strong game and in Seattle, I just kind of let's get every, like the future and all of this out of, let's just put this away and let's just focus on hockey. Right. So I don't know if my, my opinion of the team changed so much as maybe like I, I want to wait and see and you know, like the it's a bit more of they just they're just gonna play hockey and just let's let's take this slow. Let's let's not like I know that there's a bunch of people out there that want to you know trade seven guys just before American Thanksgiving, but I thought you guys did a really good job of explaining what what will be what can be done and what simply is not going to be done at this particular point and how long this process is going to be. Um I, I'm at a wait and see mode. Let's wait and see. Um, Len, let's see what these weeks go on. I mean, we're I, I don't think the Flames need to be in any hurry to, to make any decisions right now. Let's just play hockey. And, yeah, and th- th- thanks th- for your uh, thanks for comments on last week's show. I know Matt and I have got a lot of feedback online, and we're pretty happy with that one. Matt, go ahead. Yeah, and it's one of those where the team's either going to rebound or it's not, and you really can't tell like if this team will bounce back and go on that seven game winning streak that we talk about and you know reset themselves and push for a playoff spot or if they're going to be a perpetual basement dweller we don't know yet and at least with how things have been done thus far it takes a lot of the pressure off the team for the next little bit allows them to get their game going and with there not being so many games on the road and having more time to practice, 
This team should get all of their ducks in a row soon. And we'll see. And at least we can say we're better than Edmonton. <laughs> That's right. Well, and you know, just I'll give my co- co- sorry, Kev, I was just going to say the coach's Go ahead, perspective Kev. on this too. I mean, we've got a, there's a new coach here in Ryan Huska and there's a new assistant coach in Mark Savard. And it's been really two months that they've been able to kind of put their stamp on this team. And, you know, and everyone wanted a whole bunch of better things, but the, the, there's, there's so much inexperience, like there's, there's experience here in industry. Like there's so much going on here. Like, I mean, Backlund's Backlund scored his first goal of the year last night or or Saturday night. Sorry. As a captain, like there's so, and it's his first 10, 11 games of being a captain, Ryan Huska's first 10, 11 games being a coach, like as much they, and Mark Savard's first 11 games as an assistant coach, or, you know, just like, let I, I, this team needs to breathe. This team needs to absolutely, this team hasn't been able to take a breath since August of 20, of 2022, when Johnny Gaudreau and Matthew Kuchuk basically left. Since that summer, this team has been in a hyperventilating PTSD stressful mode. Let's, let's just let them play hockey. Yeah, I think that's fair. There. Yep. You know, my thoughts on it is I think going into last week, I was just seeing the team spinning their wheels. They weren't getting better. They weren't making headway. They were just kind of doing the same thing night after night and not getting the results. And yes, they lost four to three to Dallas. But as I said, I thought the systems were coming along. They won six, three against the you know Seattle Kraken. Now I think the score is a little misleading because there was two empty netters there, but you know, they finally broke the six game losing streak. And both of those games, I thought we saw, as we talked about the youth infusion helping, I think we've seen the systems coming together. I think we're seeing guys better understanding what they need to do. So for me, I'm not, I mean, I'm not going to say now, Oh wow, they won one game. They looked good. They're going to the playoffs. I still think they've got a long road to go, but my thoughts on this team has changed. I'm starting to say the Calgary flames can put this together. And I'll be honest, they worked really hard to get that win in Seattle. Like they, they had to bust their butts to get that win. And and I think that, you know, if I'm the coach right now, I'm saying, guys, you showed that if you put in the work, you can get the result. And I think now it's all going to be on. Can they do that again? Can they put in the same work? And if they can, I think they can go somewhere. I don't think they're going to go to the Stanley cup. I don't think they're going to go to the Western conference finals, but you know, can they crack the playoffs? Sure, I think it's still feasible, but this team has to keep moving forward, and they can't just keep spinning their wheels like we saw for the first ten games. Yeah, and realistically, by January first, like this team needs to be at or near five hundred to realistically have a, a chance at the postseason. And you know, we'll see. Can, can if they keep it up, it's good. Can I, sure. I, I know that we're talking like there's this is the thing that I, I'm you know, we're talking about American Thanksgiving, we talk about Christmas, we talk about New Year's when this team needs to be here, there, and the other thing. Let's just get through the week, let's just see what happens with Nashville. I mean, right now, I'm, I'm looking at the standings here, and they are three points behind Seattle, who they won last night in the division, and they are four points out of a playoffs. It's not great, but it's not. It's not terrible. It's not great, but it's not San Jose. It's not San. It's not San Jose, and it's not Edmonton. But you know what? You win the week, and you just start incrementally yeah. building better. Like um, Vancouver is playing great right now, but they're due for a slump. Vegas is going eleven one and one. Are they going to win sixty seven games? Uh, I don't know. I'm still not sold on LA, and Anaheim is off to a great start. Like the, these, there's some teams that haven't had a bump in the road yet. Oh, and I, I no, I, I agree with you. Yep, and yeah, and I think not just like, win the win the game, but like you said, win the week. I mean, if they go out there and they crap the bed against Nashville, they're back to square one. Yeah, and as much as like some some teams have been really good, like other teams have been just downright terrible. That shouldn't be as well, and you know, like Nashville and Minnesota should not be where they're at in the standings either. And you know, Anaheim is on a different planet from where they were. So, you know, things will correct themselves over time. Yeah. The Flames have eight games between now and U.S. Thanksgiving, just as a re- frame of reference here, because we've mentioned U.S. Thanksgiving a few times. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I, you know, and, 
You know, and I think it's about like, you know, like Kevin said, winning the week, but also going, okay, let's, you know, look for milestones within. Let's win the back to back. You know, let's try to, even if we can't win both, let's try to be the better team in both. You know, like I think it's just about finding in every game saying, did we improve on the one before it? And were we the better team, even if we didn't get the, get the win? But I think, you know, also improving on what we did last night. Yeah. Yeah. And that hasn't been the case so far. I think a lot of times they've gone backwards the next night. Yeah. Yeah. It, again, you're learning a system. It's, it, there's a new relationship going on here, right? There's a new relationship from the coach. Um, then there's a new relationship with these players to coach. This relationship is all different. And, you know, um, people are working. There's there, there's things that we're, we're there, this team is working through for sure. And, you know, as Matt mentioned earlier, a lot of practice time this month. I mean, you know, they've got two games off now for the next game, two games after that, two games next weekend. Like, you know, this team has a lot of time off this month. And if anything, I think that might be what turns them around at this point is just having practice time at home. Yeah. Well, and we've seen like when new players come to the team, like Dougie Hamilton and Noah Hannafin, when they first got here, like for the first month and a half, they were terrible. And then they slowly worked their way into the team and became the player that they were. And it's one of those, I think, that like the whole team is trying to get on the same page with the coaching staff and learning how to do things. And you're starting to see fewer really blatant errors. They're still happening, but it's getting closer and closer. And Mackenzie Weger yeah. also was another one that had a he had a rough start and he got his game. I mean, I and I, I know that there's, there's going to be people that will dis- disagree with me, but I don't believe Jonathan Huberdo is is as bad of a hockey player as he has played in his tenure with the Flyers. I yeah. I still believe that there's a better player. In Jonathan oh yeah, Huberdeau. it's one of those because like I used to watch a lot of Panthers games because they were they've been my second favorite team for a long time, and he is very much like get the puck off of his stick when there's somebody driving to the net, but the flames don't do that effectively. And so he's kind of having to react to things that he's not used to. Whereas in Florida, like his line mates would just no book it to the net. The puck will magically find its way on my stick. And I got a good chance on the goalie and Huberto doesn't have those options available to him which is more on his line mates than himself. But even then, I mean, he's played just over 90 games here as a flame now. I mean, you know, at some point you've got to figure out how to change your game to work with who you're playing with. True. Uh, And we're starting to see his game coming around a little bit more. Like, he was really good in the last game as well, I thought. And, you know, it it just... Both, like, the Flames need more players that suit his style and... Uh, he needs to be more flexible as well. I was just going to ask, um, and just a little bit of just on this, um, the name Anthony Duclair has come up a few times. Um, he played with Huberto, of course, in Florida. Um, he's in San Jose now. Um, would this be a guy worth taking a shot at? If it was a very dirt cheap acquisition cost, sure. Uh, you know, like if it, say it was like Dylan Dubé for Duclair, like I, I think that would be a fair trade for both teams and, you know, go from there. I don't think, Kevin, at this point, if you're the Flames, you can get away with acquiring a top NHL player. Like I think they're either kind of bound to what they've got or they've got a rebuild. And I think, you know, before you could go out and pay the acquisition costs that Duclair would real- realistically give you, you've got to show you can do it with this roster for one more year. I don't think he'd be, I don't think he'd be, a, I agree with Matt though. I don't think he'd be a significant cost. The other, the other thing that I'm just thinking about is I wonder if Manjapani is as close to Duclair as we have in, in the, this yeah, point. I think so. Yeah. And you're starting to see that chemistry build between the two of them, so we'll see. It'll yeah. be an interesting storyline to follow over the next few months anyway. For sure, yeah. 
Um, Kevin, you had added something to our notes you wanted to talk about, and you wanted to go, I feel like I need the harp for the 90s uh, sitcom flashback scenes. You wanted to flash back to last weekend's Heritage Classic when Evander Kane said, what are you going to do about it on the ice? Do you want to walk us through that that uh, yeah, scene I, a little I bit for those that didn't this, see it? This, this wasn't talked about enough the last little bit, and this kind of relates to why I think it's important that Prospisol is in this lineup. Um, Evander Kane, it's it's a pushing and shoving. And, you know, when Milan Lucic was with the Flames, when Erica Branson was with the Flames, when, you know, I, I Matthew Kachuk, even I remember the first game against the Oilers on that first Saturday on Hockey Night in Canada. Madison Kadri walked up to Evander Kane and said, you're going to do nothing today. And this was a very different Evander Kane that was walked out in his Hulk Hogan little toque and glasses. And um, he basically called this team out in a sense, you know, what do you, he, he called this team a little bit weak. And that's why I think it's great that Prospisol is up. And I don't think that that was a coincidence. Um, I don't think that that sat well with this organization that event that got on, you know, I'm not saying they're blaming that that got on TV, but this that to me is, and this is, you know, last week on our show, Dan, I went on a, a rant about this idea of tanking and why I despise it so much. Matt and I talked about the same. It's, it is, you need to have an identity to win championships and be consistent. I mean, and the Kane called out the Flames' identity. That's why I, I'm not saying that I want Pospisil to go and fight Evander Kane. That's not what I'm asking. But I'm sure as hell not asking uh, uh, Evander Kane. I want Evander Kane to know that someone is going to do something about it. And, it, you know, like, that was the most confidence the Oilers displayed all year. And, you know... This, you know, that that needs to stop. Yeah, and frankly, you see the the flames like throughout like the, since basically the 0304 Cup run that they have not really had a consistent identity, uh, other than maybe the 1415 season where it was all the young guys just with reckless abandon, you know, throwing everything at the wall. You can find away yeah, times. but you know, like that. And that's not a sustainable identity either, but, you know, like, the team just needs to realize, like, what it takes for for the successful teams and then go get more of those guys. And that's why, like, when the Flames acquired A.J. Greer, I was very thrilled with that acquisition because here's a player who's played on a very, very good Boston team and knows what it takes to actually be successful. And frankly he's been the most consistent player on the team in my books uh to start the year you know you always wish for more from him but he's also a limited player he is a fourth line guy but he's doing like all of the right things every time he's out there yeah and you know as much as there was a lot of criticism towards the guys like trevor lewis and milan lucic last year and i got it but i also uh, i they brought something to this team that the this organization didn't really have a lot of and grit professionalism understanding what it takes to win and you know i just don't think either i think very clearly i i'll i i will say this if milan lucic is wearing a flames jersey I don't think Evander Kane says, ask the Flames, what are you going to do about it? Because he knows damn well no, that Milan Lucic would have done something about it. And I will also yeah. say that if Erica Branson was wearing a Flames jersey, Evander Kane doesn't say that. It's Derek England. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, any of those type of guys. Yeah, definitely. And it's one of those where you both need to draft and sign those type of guys. And, you know, it has been interesting over the last while like the flames have definitely over the drafts for the like the last decade have basically focused more on getting the high skill guys because they didn't frankly have any of that for the duration um which they graduated a bunch of guys like the dubes the manjapanes uh kachuk bennett gaudreau monahan all that but it's like now needing a balance between guys that 
are very skilled, but also guys that can play that effective, edgy game while being not embarrassingly bad at the same And even time. if you don't draft those guys, I mean, like, Klapka's undrafted, right? Those are kind of... Remember when Daryl Sutter was the GM and it was kind of the Western Canadian boys, we all said. Like, I think you can bring a lot of that in through Europe, through, you know, undrafted free agents, but I think you just need to make yeah. sure you're getting both in the organization. Yeah, the Garnett Hathaway signing, for example. Walker Dewar, yeah. Parker Bell. There you go. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. So I, I, I just... Yeah, I, to me, that's, yeah, I wanted to bring that because nobody talked about that and, and, you know. And Kevin, I think that's part of establishing the identity, like we talked about earlier, yeah. you know, I mean, is this, is this team gritty? Does this team stand up for themselves? Is this just a bunch of soft, you know, guys? I think having those kind of players can help you establish your identity. Yeah. Well, and that's why, like, when it came time, like, for all the free agents to be, like, um, for the Flames, the, the only guy that I actually really want the Flames to keep above all the rest is Zadorov for exactly that reason. Even if you have to overpay him a bit, he, he just brings those intangibles that it, are impossible to find. Yeah. I get that. I get it. Well, guys, I, I, I think that pretty much... He can oh, go, go ahead, Kev. That's that's I would personally hate to see Tanev, and I would also personally hate to see Lynn Hill go, but I totally understand that. What's happening? I yeah. think Tanev might have to go just because of his age, and especially if he gets hurt again this year. Yeah, I Great. don't know in a rebuild if you'd be able to to swallow that contract if they go that way. Well, you could get a first rounder for Tanev. Like, am I? Oh yeah. Late, like, I, I mean, if you're going to get a uh, early late first rounder for some of the other defensemen that have been out there, I certainly think you should be get. We, there's no reason not to expect one for Chris Tanev. Yeah. And I think that the best thing for Tanev might be to move Tanev for that reason. I think he might have more value as a trade piece. Yeah. And that's not to say that you don't revisit him in the, the off season or whatever, but I think for now there are higher priorities. For sure. Guys, should we get into predictions? Let's do a double prediction episode since we won't have a fireside chat next week. Let's do a six game prediction uh, streak, shall we? Sure. So this this next week, this next week, the Flames play three games. They play Tuesday, 7 p.m. back to normal hockey times um, at the Dome against Nashville. They play a back to back this weekend, Friday, 5 p.m. start time in Toronto and Saturday, 5 p.m. start time on on Saturday against Ottawa. Then they go uh, to Montreal the following Tuesday, and then Thursday and Saturday we have Vancouver and the Islanders. So six games. I'll throw mine in there first. I know there's a lot of games to to go with. I'm going to say that they beat the Predators. I'm going to say that they, like, this is where it's hard for me because I see them turning the corner. I think they're going to beat the Predators. I think they're going to lose to Toronto, and I think they'll probably end up beating Ottawa for this week. Um, let me just put this down so I don't forget it. Um, I'm going to say that for next week, they beat Montreal and that's it. They Matt, what do you Vancouver think? The Islanders. Yep. <sighs> um, I'll do Matt and then we'll come to Kevin. Yeah. I, I agree with you for this week of, uh, the order and everything. Um, Next week, I think that they beat Montreal. Um, they beat Vancouver, and uh, then they lose to the Islanders. Okay, so you're going to say that in the next six, they win four of them. Yeah. Okay, before Kevin, I begin my predictions, I'm going to back, I need to back this up with a very, 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 very bold prediction. Right. Um, so I believe that DJ Smith will be fired this week by the Ottawa Senators, which means there will be a new coach in there. So I think they beat Nashville. I think they beat Toronto and I think they lose to the senators because of that. Uh, and I think they do, they'll beat Montreal. Although Montreal has been pretty good. And I think they will lose to Vancouver and beat the Islanders. Okay. So, I mean, we're all predicting of six games, at least three wins. You guys both have four different four. I have three. So we're all thinking this team's starting to turn things around. Um, outside of Ottawa, where do you play Vladar, Kevin? Oh, 
Um, the Cleveland um, are on the back to back, right? Yeah. So I'm I'm actually, and this is no disrespect to Markstrom, but I'm actually this is my I thought. Um, I think he plays should play against Nashville, and if he wins, you throw him in against Toronto, and then you throw Markstrom in on Ottawa. Interesting. Okay. And Matt, what about you? I think uh, I would actually play Markstrom against uh, Nashville and Ottawa and let Ladar have the Toronto game. Um, just because, uh, you know, give the Leafs a bit of a different look and see. Um, frankly, I think that, like, you're better, you stand a better chance of winning the, the Ottawa game with Markstrom than you have with him playing against Toronto and Vladar playing against Ottawa. Hmm. Interesting. So. I think if I think I would, and then give probably Le- the Islander game after that. Okay, I'd give Vladar Nashville. I think if he looks good, you put him in Toronto. If not, you make the change and you play the other guy on the opposite night. I'd give Vladar Min- uh, Montreal, and I. <sighs> I'm debating if you do Vancouver or uh, the Islanders. I don't think if you give them Montreal, you can give them Vancouver as well. I don't think you can give them two in a row, maybe two weeks in a row. So I'm going to say Montreal and yeah, I'll go with those three. I'm going to say he plays Nashville. He plays Ottawa and he plays Montreal. So I guess, I guess we'll find out. Maybe as we said earlier, maybe Dustin Wolf gets called up, scores a goal and changes the flames fortunes this week. Oh, yeah, Gets his first shutout and first NHL goal in the same game. Yeah. Um, before we sign off, Kevin, do you want to let everyone know about shifts and pucks and where they can hear you? Yes. Okay. So we, uh, we are available. We're fine podcasts or so. So we talk about two teams. Mostly we talk about the Canucks and we talk about the flames. Um, so we have a, there's a group of us that are flames fans and there's a group of us that are Canucks fans. And we just like to shooting the crap about hockey. Um, and so there will be a Canucks episode We're we're kind of the, the, challenges is in terms of scheduling and and you know sometimes with podcasting it's like herding cats to get everybody together so and if as you went as herded cats you know how hard that is but we will have one canucks episode and then we will have one flames episode and i'll be returning the daily news pack i i used to do a daily news pack just to talk about the news of the week or the day in the hockey and there's lots of things going on right now not only in the nhl just a lot of other things um you know, a lot of other news today that we just, uh, a lot of time in podcasts, we you don't have the time to cover. So I just go through them, talk about them, preview the games. But we Canucks focus uh, earlier in the week and then later in the week, we will talk Flames. Uh, we bring Dan on every once in a while. Uh, we'll bring Matt on. And so we'll be doing a crossover episode, talking a little bit about what has happened with the Flames this week. And I'm sure there'll be some interesting things to talk about. We can follow us at Shifts and Puck, Shifts and Pucks, and subscribe wherever fine podcasts are sold for free. So you guys will post on your feeds everywhere what, when that Flames episode will be this week. But, of course, if you don't want to listen there, you will also get that in yeah. your regular Fireside Chat feed next yeah. week as well. We'll, we'll be doing a, we'll be trying to present ourselves a little bit more on the social medias about when we post. And so, um, yeah, tell your friends about us. We do a lot of work, and we, we think we're a good podcast. And, uh, Matt, you'll be joining them this week. Do you want to take us out? As always, go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.